Amen, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Go ahead and have a seat. I want to, good morning, everybody. I want to look into the lens and say good morning to everybody who is watching online, wherever you're watching from. We are thrilled uh, to have you with us. We, with, we wish you were here underwater with us. Um, did y'all notice John Gaines didn't take a breath the entire time he was, I don't know if you saw John Gaines behind the whale, um, but uh, that was uh, amazing. It is so cool. I, like, wait, hold on just a second. I'll try this right here. I'm being eaten by, ah! You got to look at the screen. That's, that's, weird. that's for the online folks. Um, and then everybody here underwater with me, good morning. Good morning, balcony people. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Hello, Nave. Right side. Left side. They're growing. They're growing, man. Uh, it, is, it is such an incredible. I, I love this Sunday um, when we come into our VBS week because I never know what's going to happen uh, in here, even though I've been seeing it created and happening. Look, if y'all don't know this, uh, pound for pound, not even pound for pound, bar none, we have the best children's ministry team around. Um, You may not have kids, but having a strong children's ministry team makes a strong church and, um, and a strong children's program. And so we have just such an incredible group of women that, uh, that work with us, led by Natalie Jones, Miss Natalie, who is up here. She is, uh, she, they, they, they almost seriously begin work on VBS next week. Um, it is, it's insane how much goes into this and how many binders and planning and we have, in our office, we have an, an entire wall that's a whiteboard, and she takes it over and leaves angry messages, do not erase, um, as we're leading up to this. But it, she was here, I was here yesterday, and she and her daughter were out on the playground, tumping things over, way to go, Easy e out there, um, tumping things over, cleaning it up. She's like, I want it to be great for the kids on Monday, and just doing that is just amazing. And Jessica and Elizabeth also just pour in so much. But this up here, I, I mean, come on. Th this is amazing. And uh, we, we have one of our children's teams, she does our Sunday, she does our special needs Sunday school, um, and she works for the school and, and decorates and created a castle for her, but th th her name's Hannah Beaver. Um, and if you know Hannah Beaver, um, like, she's crazy gifted. To see some of, like, these are pool noodles that she's been cutting up, slicing up to create the little things, and like sponges, and just all the different things and the dead guy in the water, that's a little creepy, but come, come tomorrow, we'll talk, I'm talking about it tomorrow, but um, just so amazing, um, and just so, so thank you, I don't even see Hannah in the room right now, she's probably, she, at this time of year, oh, she's on the floor back there, she has a fanny pack on at all times, and she has a Carhartt, um, like, apron, because a normal apron isn't strong enough for her, um, and so she's throwing scissors in and out, and um, it's just, Hannah, thank you, I don't see, I, I think I see you back there. Somewhere. She's right there. There's your hand. Uh, thank you, Hannah, for doing this. It truly is amazing. I guarantee you, I'm the only pastor on planet Earth preaching underwater today. Come on, somebody. Um, so VBS is going to be fun, going to be exciting, all those kids there this week. But today we begin our first, see, our first sermon in our summer sermon series. That's really hard to say very quickly. Our sermon, ser sermon, ser see, I can't even say it, summer sermon series. Um, and uh, I'm excited. I talked about it last week that Jenna had this idea. Let's do Psalm, let's do the summer in the Psalms, summer in the Psalms. And I was like, that's a stu stupid idea, horrible idea. Five minutes later, I come back. What about the Psalms of summer? Oh, yeah. Psalms of summer, baby. Bam, there you go. The Psalms of summer. And so that's what we go with because this is in just a pretty face, everybody. I have great ideas, too. Um, and the Psalms of summer, and I love this title. And we're going to walk through all summer long to, till August different psalms. There's going to be no rhyme or reason as to why they're, they're not connected to one another except that they're in the same book of the Bible, Psalms. And the Psalms of summer, it may, surely it makes you think of the songs of summer, right? Because every time we get to it, there's always like the song of the summer, the songs of summer. And, um, and my son and his, some of his friends, they, like four years ago, they started thinking of what's our song for the summer? Like, what are we going to play? And like, by the end of the summer, like you play that song one more time. Like, you know, I'm going to do nothing to you because you're ginormous, but um, I made it yeah. So, but the songs that get stuck in your head for the summer and everything, and you know, Billboard has been tracking this since 1958, with the biggest songs of the summer, those earworms that you just pray will not come on the radio by the end of the summer, but you're excited in June for them. 
So, and, and I printed off a list. We're going to go every five years. And I tell you, it's been really funny to see the reaction. 9.15 was crushing the first half of this. Like, they knew it. Uh, they knew the first half. When we started getting to the back half, they were looking at me like I was crazy. Um, and it kind of flopped uh, at the 9.30 service. We'll see you at the 11 o'clock, how you all do. In 1958, the song of the summer, number one song according to Billboard, was sung by Domenico Madungo. Right? Everybody know what it is? Let me give you the title. Nel Blu Dipinto di Blu. Anyone? You might know it by its more common name. Volare. Yes. Good job. Yeah. So that was 1958. Okay, 1960, Brenda Lee brought in. Anybody? Shout it out if you know it. I'm sorry. That was the song. What a sad song of the summer. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, 1965, the Rolling Stones brought satisfaction. There you go. Uh, 1970, the Carpenters brought you. Say it louder. You had it right. Somebody just said it over there. Close to you. La, da, 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 da. Um, in 1974, I had to throw this one in because that was the year I was born, and I wanted to know what my parents were listening to as I came onto the world. It was a John Denver song, which makes me feel good about myself because it wasn't the Rolling Stones, but John Denver, I'm like, yeah, I can get behind me some John Denver. Anybody know what John Denver brought you in 1974? Annie song, there it is. You were at the first service, Ralph. That's cheating. Um, Annie song. 1975, the Eagles brought you. No, I knew you'd all say that. One of these nights, one of these nights, you're all going to get it. 1980, it was Billy Joel's turn to be at the top with. I think somebody said it. It's still rock and roll to me. Still rock and roll. Uh, 1985, this one's going to stick in your head for those of you that know it. Tears for Fears brought you what? Shout, shout. These are the things I can do without. Come on. 1990, Mariah Carey was number one, and she had vision of love. I asked the band before the first service, for the 915, I was walking through some of these because I didn't know them, and I'm like, does anyone know vision of love? And Manuel goes, no, but it probably goes, ee, ee. <laughs> It's a Mariah Carey joke for those of you who don't know. I thought that was really funny. 1992, this is when I lost the 915 service for sure. It was brought to you by Sir Mix-a-Lot. Come on. I like, okay, um, yeah. Maybe got back. 1995, Lisa Lopez was on this album. It was Lisa Left Eye Lopez, not our Lisa Lopez, but yes, it was from TLC, and it was Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls. Don't Go Chasing Waterfalls. Two th the year 2000, Matchbox 20. Anyone know it? I'm going to say it, and you're still not going to know it. Bent. Anybody? Yeah, I don't know. Bent. Uh, 2000. 2005, Mariah Carey, 15 years later, shows up once again with We Belong Together. Still don't know it. 2010, Katy Perry, Feet, Snoop Dogg. Anybody? Who said it? Was that Ballantyne? Oh, my gosh, you just outed yourself as a Katy Perry guy. I love that. Yeah, California Girls, uh, spelled G-U-R-L-S uh, there. 2015, OMI brought the ever-popular cheerleader. So some of you, uh, 11 o'clock, you're the only one who's known that. Um, uh, 2020, the baby feet Roddy Rich with two Cs. Anybody? Rockstar? Be confident in your answers. Just throw it out there. Rockstar is what it was. And 2023, who knows what the song of the summer was for last summer? Grace, what was it? I see you raising your hand. It was not Frozen, no. Anybody else know what the song of the summer was for 2023? Any guesses? Think back to last year. What's your guess, Samson? I didn't hear him. It's not a real answer. Come on, Samson. Um, it was Morgan Wallen last night. Followed closely by Luke Combs' Fast Car. Um, there you go. Those are the songs of the summer in the past since 1958. And how many of you on those songs 
like some of them, for me, when we were going through these songs and we got to Katy Perry and California Girls, apparently Mr. Ballantyne knows it, but Mr. Gaines, who was playing back there, does not because he went to David Lee Roth, right? I wish they all could be California Girls. That song didn't leave my head. I went down to Fellowship Hall, I get up, I do this whole thing, I'm still singing David Lee Roth in my head as I'm going through this, it's California, I'm seeing the video, everything about it, um, and you know, the high waist and stuff, and they're on roller skates, all that stuff, and I just see all this stuff, I'm delivering my sermon, and the song is still there, David Lee Roth and I are fighting for space in my head, because that's what happens with songs. I mean, you get those songs, you get those like earworms that get into your head and it's in your head. And some of you, like I at 9.30, someone texts me in between services um, and he's in Cabo San Lucas, like show off. Um, but he's like, oh yeah, now shouts in my head for the rest of the day. And I'm like, well, you're welcome. Tears for fears for everyone, right? It's just those songs sometimes just get in your head. This is what the Psalms should be for us. Like the songs of summer that stick with us year after year, the Psalms of summer, these psalms were meant to be something that got into your head and into your heart and into your mind and soul and just stuck with you. In, in fact, if, you, if you've ever been through a read the Bible in a year plan, most likely because the vast majority of them go through psalms multiple times. You do a little New Testament, a little Old Testament, and psalms. And you come back and you do the psalms again. They were always meant to be something that you would return to and return to and hit over and over again so that they became part of you. There were songs, there were poetry, there were liturgy that would be used in temple services. There were some that were laments. There were some songs like the smite ones, the smitey psalms. Smite them, O mighty smiter. Remember that? Like, I just, God, how long will you let them have breath? Wipe them from the face of the earth. It's just, every time I marry a couple, the first time I meet with them before the wedding, I, I, we, we, I sit down and I'm like, how many days away are you from the ceremony? And inevitably, the groom-to-be does this. Because right? he has no clue. He's looking at the bride, you know, the bride-to-be. And the bride-to-be immediately goes, 62. Like, they always know. 62. I'm like, great. Start at Psalm 62. Read it together aloud tonight. Talk about it. And, and, and just immerse, and I do this for, and then tomorrow, do 61. And the next day, 60, right? We're counting down until the day of your wedding when you get to Psalm 1. And the reason I ask them to do this is a couple of things. One, I want them to get in the habit and the practice of being in Scripture together. But the other thing is, is because these Psalms were meant to be read again and again and to be internalized. So that those moments when we need something and to grab hold of something, the Psalms are what we go to. You know who went to the Psalms all the time? Jesus. He drops psalms left and right because there's some psalms, and, and I tell the couples, like, you may get to a psalm, and it's really an angry one, and he's caught, and, and whoever the author is is saying, just wipe them off the face of the earth, and, and like, and that might, may not mean anything to you because you're leading into your marriage, and you're so in love and happy, and, and your wedding day's approaching, but 10, 15 years from now, it might mean something. Come on, those of you who are married, that's funny. I don't care who you are. There might be a time when you're like, I'm so angry at you. I have a psalm about this. But then there's also those psalms that are just these, these songs of celebration and these adoration of the God who created all and who gives, gives us life and these beautiful moments of just celebrating who he is. And, and those are appropriate to bring forward at times. There's psalms of these royal enthronement songs. There's, there's so-called pilgrimage songs that people would sing. Like there's the, the famous ones are the psalms of ascension. And I did a series on this in Lent many years ago where um, when you were going up for Passover, any, anywhere you go from Israel, if you're going to Jerusalem, you have to go up because it sits higher than everywhere else. And, and you, have, you go down and you go back up. As you're climbing into Jerusalem, you would sing these Psalms of Ascension, speaking of who Jesus, they didn't see it as Jesus, we know it as Jesus, and, and the coming of the kingdom of God. And just these beautiful words that remind you and put your heart in a spirit in a moment to embrace what God is doing. That's what the Psalms are. So often we just, what are the Psalms? They're the things in the middle of the Bible, right? Because if I told you to open your Bibles, if you have a Bible, open your Bible to the Psalms, pretty much everybody just go halfway in. I'm gonna hit a Psalm somewhere and I can flip around. There's 150 of them, if I didn't already say that. There's, um, there's 10 authors, it was, is what most people say. David is, it wrote most of them, 73. 
He wrote 73 of them. Moses wrote one that we know of. Solomon wrote two that we know of. A guy named Asaph, who was a worship leader of the time, wrote 11. And then there's five other authors in there who kind of account a group of people at one point who account for the others. But they were always meant to be something that you were immersing yourself in, that you would come back to time and time again to give you hope, to give you confidence and assurance of who you are, to allow yourself to express your anger and frustration, to allow yourself to stand in awe of who God is. They're so wonderful and useful, and yet so often we just move beyond them. We forget them. So this summer we're going to dive into them. Thank you. We're going to dive into the Psalms this summer. And we're, we're going to look at them, and, and, and today we're going to start with arguably, and I know Miss Natalie has already told you what it is, but arguably the most famous of all psalms, and that is Psalm what? 23. Psalm 23, right? That's probably number one on the Billboard 100, show me 23rd Psalm, right? Um, it is arguably the most, because it's always, like I say it all the time from right up there, at funerals. Because funerals, it's, it's a beautiful, because this psalm was written by David, and we know that because at the very beginning it says, a psalm of David. So it's one of David's psalms, and it's a psalm of confidence and trust in the one who created all things. That's, that's why it's kind of a great one for funerals, because it's a psalm. It's, there's other psalms of confidence and trust in there, but this one, it's six verses, so it's not very long, but it paints this beautiful imagery of who God is and who we are because of it. 95% of the time, I read from the New Living Translation, NLT, when I read to you. I'm going to read it to you in this one, and then I want to do some others, because I almost guarantee you that if I said, how many of you can recite the 23rd Psalm, over half of you would raise your hands. I think if if I said, how many of you know the first line of Psalm 23, I think everybody would raise your hand. It is so well known. But I think if you continued from the first line and you went deeper, you might start saying things differently depending on the translation that is most dear to you. Most of us would probably know the second one I'm gonna do, but here's the first. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Beautiful, beautiful imagery. But here's the one, and and the one that I actually, if you ask me to say the 23rd Psalm from memory, I will say a combination of the King James and the New King James. How many of you read the King James version of the Bible these days? Okay, there's other versions if you're still reading it. It's okay. Like, unless you're 80 or above, I'll give you a pass. But um, the, the, the King James version was, there's a lot of historical stuff behind it. We don't have time to get into it, but it's this one. If you know the King James Version, it's the one that talks like this. Ethel Thayer, right? There's a lot of this, that kind of stuff. It's a little strange when you try to read it. But there is beauty, and this is the New King James Version. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see right there, I can't get away from the word runneth. Um, I, every time I do that, I say runneth instead of my cup runs over. But, but I love the beauty of that as compared to the NLT. Here's another one. This is Eugene Peterson's The Message. God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. 
You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid when you walk at my side. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. I love that. I love all three different versions because they bring and they elevate a different aspect of it for me when I think of these words. They're, they're focusing on the same, it's the same stuff and it's the same imagery, but it just points to something different. So I want to break them down, and I'm not going to spend time on all six verses because there's a lot there. I just want to talk really about two of them. One, there's, just to get the other stuff, besides still waters restores my soul and paths of righteousness. Here's something, for his name's sake. How we walk in this world doesn't just reflect us, it reflects him. That's a whole nother sermon series. But this is what it's pointing to. And he talks about my security while I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Does anyone else go to gangster's paradise at that moment? Yeah? Okay, good. I'm glad you're there with me. I will fear no evil, right, because you're with me. Now look, here's the image, and David uses two different images to describe who God is in this short psalm. The first one he opens up with is shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, that may not mean anything to us because we've heard the 23rd Psalm most all of our lives. Yes, the Lord is my shepherd. I get that. We also know the life of Jesus, and Jesus used that metaphor quite often, as did the gospel writers when discussing who Jesus is. But when David said it, it was groundbreaking. The Lord is my shepherd. Whoa. What? Nah, the Lord's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my strong shield. The Lord is king. He's the Lord. All of these different elements, all of these different descriptors to describe who God is, and David changes it because he uses those to describe God also, but he changes it for this psalm, and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. And I want you to know why that's so different. Because for David, David was King David, right? But before he was King David, who was he? What did he do? He was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. He knew intimately what that word shepherd meant. And it's an intimate word. It's a beautiful word. It's a sacrificial word. See, a shepherd, how many of you are shepherds in the room today? Yeah, none of you, right? We're not shepherds, except those of you who have like five kids. You're a shepherd. You qualify. But the rest of us, we're not shepherds. Shepherds were... Um, there was, there was, it was usually the job was held by the youngest child of the family, the lowliest child of the family. If it's a boy or if it's a girl, they would go out into the wilderness, take care of the flocks of sheep. They were the shepherds. It was a family business. You had this big flock of sheep. Flock of sheep. David was the youngest boy. All of his other siblings were off doing war, off doing other stuff. David was the shepherd. He was the one who would go out there. Now, what a shepherd's job was to do was to lay down their life to protect the flock. Their job was to ensure, because that flock of sheep, think about this, was everything to the family. It was everything to the family. You gave arguably the most important job in the family to the lowliest person. You entrusted them with this job. And so you have these shepherds who would go out into the wilderness where there were lions and tigers and bears. There were these animals. And they would attack, and you had to protect those sheep because that was your family's livelihood. That was everything to them. And so shepherds developed different systems. They would take slingshots. Remember, David has a big story about his slingshot and a really big dude that he knocks down with it. How did he know how to do that? Well, he's a shepherd. And he used it to defend his flock. If, if, a, if a lion is coming after one of his sheep, he can drop it with a stone. He also used his slingshot to direct the sheep. There were times when the sheep start going this way and he's like, no, no, I need you to go left. He drops a, a rock on the right side of his sheep and the sheep goes, oh, let's go left. They're stupid. They go where the shepherd tells them. The shepherd gave everything to take care of his flock. I have this beautiful image and this is who David says God is. He is willing to give everything for you. Now we know the rest of the story and the Jesus who God sent, who did all of it, who gave everything to care for us. 
who gave everything so that we might have life. But what he says is he leads them to green pastures. And I love this, leave the, leave, leaves them to green pastures. And, and, the, and the green pastures, what we think of is, if you've ever seen a picture of the 23rd Psalm, you, you see a guy walking around with sheep, maybe he's got a lamb on his shoulder, and you picture these fields that are full of what? Green fields, alfalfa up to your, your, your knees or something, just beautiful, and it's waving in the wind, and it's beautiful. And I tell you, that's not Israel. Like, it's certain parts of Israel. It's a very small part of Israel. If you go, and it's this beautiful area, and it looks like the Texas Hill Country, but if you go to the rest of Israel, let me tell you, keep driving on I-10, and you will see what it looks like. You go through Kerrville, and you're like, this is beautiful. This is part of Israel. That looks like part of Israel. But as you go further, and you go out into West Texas, you're going to see what the majority of Israel looks like. It's barren. It's like, how can anything live out here? And yet it does. That's the most of Israel. And so you have these shepherds who are guiding their flocks to green pastures. There's this teacher, he's out of Michigan, he's a high, a high school teacher, Ray Vanderlyn. Many of you may know who he is, RVL. And he tells this story of his first time he was walking in the wilderness of Israel. And he's walking along and he's with people from Israel. And he sees these shepherds and their flocks of sheep and everything. And he's like, what do these sheep eat? And the guy looks at him like, you don't know what sheep eat? He said, well, yes, they eat like grass and stuff, but look around. There's nothing out here. And the guy explains to him, no, no, no. So in, in the springtime, we'll, we'll get some rains that come through here, and the clay kind of soaks it in, and, and, it, and it holds it. And then in the summertime, off the Mediterranean Sea, these humid, humid winds come across the baking hot clay, and they cause this condensation to fall in these pockets. And so there's little pockets where tufts of grass appear right here, and a tuft over here, and a tuft over here, and this guy goes, and the shepherd's job is to lead the sheep to those tufts. And they'll get enough from that tuft. And maybe they move to the next one. The shepherd's job was to lead them to just enough. And Ray has this guy, he's like writing notes down furiously. And he goes, what do they call these things? He goes, green pastures. And then Ray's like, oh. the shepherd's job, listen. This is what God does for us, and this is where I want you to be right now. As we come into this summer, hear this, that God's going to give you what you need. God's going to give you what you need. He's going to pop that tuft of grass up. When the rest of the world sees that there's barrenness and there's no life and there's nothing there, God says, but I know where it is, and I know what you need. I will give you just enough from one tuft to the next. The rest of the world may say, you're going to starve and die out there, but God says, no, 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 no. Allow me to guide you, and I will lead you to just enough. Gosh, that's beautiful, isn't it? Man, I, I, think, so, I think some people need to hear that today, that, hey, God's got you in the midst of this darkness. It goes to the valley of the shadow of death. It's like, I got you in this moment. But then he moves from calling God his shepherd, and he changes it, and he says God is also a host. And the difference between a shepherd and a host really isn't much. Because a shepherd's job was to protect, defend, and to provide for the sheep. A host's job, back in this time in the Middle East, and it still is in the Middle East, is when you come into my house, I'm going to provide for you, but I'm also going to protect you as well. Remember the story of Lot in the Old Testament? When Lot is there in the, old, in the city of Sodom, and these two people come, these two angels, these visitors come and visit him, and the crowd just get, they, they want to attack these two guys, and he brings, Lot brings them into this home. And he says, no, 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 you are my guests. I will protect you. I, will, I am going to die so that you can live. In fact, he, he offers them the, his daughters, right? He's like, take my daughters instead, like father of the year material right there. But it just goes to show you that this, the host protects as well as provides. And David shifts this, this image. He goes, yes, God is my shepherd. But then he comes back to it. And he goes, he's gonna lead me to what I need, what I need, what I need, just enough, just enough, just enough. But then he's gonna host me. And when he hosts me, he's gonna sit me down at a table in the presence of my enemies. Can I tell you, this is a victory celebration. This is a time when God says, come into my table and let's see Satan and the world go, you not today, Satan, because we win. He says, my cup runneth over. Here's the problem if we stay just at the top of this Psalm 23 and we just say that God's gonna lead us, he's gonna be our shepherd, he's gonna guide us to green pastures that just enough, just enough, just enough. That is a good place to be and if that's all God ever gave us, that would be great and just enough. 
but that's not God, what all God has for us. See, I believe that God wants more for us. And that, hey, if you think this is a prosperity gospel message, let's talk after this, because prosperity gospel ain't true. But I think God wants more of his presence in our life. God wants more of his peace in our life. God wants more of his mercy and his love and his compassion in our life. And he says, I'm willing to pour it into your cup if you would just leave the just enough camp and come into the overflow camp. See, what I'm saying is so many of us get stuck in this just enough that we become victims. We become victims of the limitations of what the world says is real. We're not victims, we're victors. Come on, that's why it's a victory dinner. That's why when we come and we sit at God's table, it's like it's a celebration. Because God wants to pour out for us more than we could ask or imagine. So here's what I want you to do. I want you, if you've never said God will deliver just enough for me, get in the place and trust that God is going to deliver just enough for you this summer. As you go into this season, I hope you get rest. I hope you go on vacation. I hope you have a wonderful time with your family or whatever it is that you do. I hope you just step into that place. God, I got just enough. I got just enough. I got just enough. But I don't want you to stay there. But I want you, you ever wanted a new car? You, you ever been like, you, you ever been the market? Like, you know what? I, I want a new cyber truck. Said nobody ever. It's good. If you have one, it looks good on you. It's great. Thank you for saving the world. Um, but, those are ugly, aren't they? Um, it, it, like you wanted a truck, like you want a pickup truck, you're like, I want a pickup truck, I don't know what kind. Of... When you start driving around, what do you see all the time? Pickup trucks. Did everybody else decide that they wanted a truck at the same time and start driving a truck around when you decided that you wanted a truck? No. It's the same trucks that have been driving around you all the time. It's all of a sudden you're aware of them. You're open to their presence because you're thinking about them, you're, you're looking for them. Can I ask you to get into a standpoint where you're open for the presence of God this summer? Like be thinking about it. Don't be thinking about that. Try to be thinking about everywhere you go, like God, I'm, I'm expecting to see your presence. God, I'm expecting, I'm holding my cup and I'm ready for you to fill it overflowing. Come on, somebody. That's walking into a summer. That's going, I'm going to expect the presence of God this summer. Man, you attack every day that way. God, I know you're gonna give me just enough, but here's my cup. I want more of your presence. Who doesn't want more of your presence? And like, I need more of God's presence in how I love my wife. I need more of God's presence in how I interact with my kids and how I lead here. I need more of God's presence. Don't you want more of God's peace in your life? No, I'm good. I like turmoil. Thank you. No, be expectant for the abundance of God. He is shepherd, he is host, and he is ready to pour out. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you have given us. We thank you that you offer us this table of victory. And that table of victory was first celebrated the night that you would be betrayed. We all grab our elements right now and you can peel off that first layer. As he sat around the table with his disciples, he took the bread, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. After supper was over, he took the cup and he blessed God. He said, take this, drink, this is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. And so we come in remembrance of these mighty acts. And God, we thank you that you are our shepherd and you offer us just enough, but we also thank you that you are our host that celebrates the victory with us. And you want to abundantly do more than we could ask or imagine and pour out your peace and your presence on us. And so Father, I pray that as we consume this body and blood of Jesus, we would be holy and living sacrifices, proclaiming your abundance to a world that says there isn't enough. We know that in the kingdom of God, there is. So Father, we thank you and praise you and ask that you would use this to help us be the sons and daughters, to walk that path that you have laid before us and bring honor to your name. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. The ushers are coming forward right now and they're gonna quickly pass the offertory because I went way too long, but I thought those music titles were necessary. Um, <laughs> my, my wife does not, but I thought they were good. Um, and we learned something about Valentine. Um, if you would, please pray a blessing over this offertory. Father, we thank you and praise you for all that you've given us, all that we have is yours. 
And so we take a moment now to give back to you. Say, receive this offering. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, may you use it to glorify and magnify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand and worship with us one more time. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dear May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, lift his countenance unto you, give you his peace. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful Sunday, a blessed week, and we'll see you.